Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today, we'll be wrapping up our coverage of Melissa Brannon's case by discussing Caleb Hughes's trial. We'll be going over witness statements, events in Hughes's past that may have set him on the path he followed into adulthood, and most importantly, the physical evidence that led him to be tried for this terrible crime. Today's episode is part two of the disappearance and presumed murder of Melissa Brannon. So last week, we ended the episode by learning that Caleb Hughes had been indicted for the charge of abduction with the intent to defile in Melissa Brannon's disappearance. We'll start off this episode working through a basic overview of the initial hearings and the trial itself, and I'm also going to give you some information regarding Caleb Hughes's past. So in November of 1990, Caleb had been charged with abduction with the intent to defile and soon after was indicted on those charges with his trial set to begin February 25th, 1991. Trial had been originally set for late January, but was postponed, and Caleb's attorney was a man by the name of Peter Greenspun. Melissa's family had come forward at one point prior to trial and mentioned how they were glad that Caleb was being indicted, but it didn't provide them with really any sense of relief because they still had no idea where Melissa was, and that was the most frustrating and upsetting part for them. Now, during all of these early hearings prior to the start of trial, which were taking place in December of 1990 and January of 1991, There was surprisingly a fair amount reported regarding documentation and evidence that defense attorney Greenspun was attempting to get from Prosecutor Haran's office. And from what I can tell, it appeared as though the prosecutor's office was kind of dragging their feet when it came to providing that documentation to the defense. As much as we've already talked about how totally suspicious we think Hughes was and how out of the ordinary his behavior was, he was still entitled to a fair trial. Now, I don't know, you know, what all of that was about in regards to the defense attorney trying to gather all this information from the prosecution, if they were withholding information or what, but there was a fair amount of reporting regarding this situation. And then at the end of the day, thankfully, the judge did declare that the prosecution had to turn over everything and they had to do so in a timely manner. And from what I can tell, that did happen. So they did what they were supposed to do, at least based on what I was able to find. I would hope that the prosecution wouldn't be trying to withhold information. Mm-hmm. The judge was probably more or less saying, hey, you need to do this in a timely fashion mm-hmm. because imagine if they withheld information and then it comes up in trial and then this guy gets out free because of a mistrial. Mm-hmm. Like that would be so messed up. Like a Brady violation. Right. So I think that they were probably just slow moving. Mm. But there were some people who said that attorney Haran was like very methodical and he was almost like secretive. They said like he would keep everything like really close to the chest and not reveal any of his cards until he was ready to. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it had anything to do with that or what, but. Or maybe he was the type of guy where if you say, you know, he held everything close to the chest, if something wasn't expressly stated as, hey, this is what I want, he wouldn't give it to him. And then they would have to put out another request to him explicitly stating, hey, we want this. Mm -hmm. And then if that's all they asked for, that's all he would give them. Yeah, and that's probably why the judge had to get involved because the defense attorney is like, listen, I'm all set with this like specificity (laughs) BS, you know. But anyway, there was also a ton of reporting regarding this one affidavit in the case against Hughes. And that document had been sealed back when investigators were first working on the case. And authorities had mentioned earlier on that they did not want this particular affidavit, like the whole affidavit released because it could have potentially harmed their investigation, which I think is totally valid and fair, because at that point in the beginning, they had no charges against this guy, and they were working on building up their case against him. Now, at least a portion of this affidavit in question appeared to be relevant to items authorities seized in the search warrant, as well as other pieces of investigative information they gathered early on. So all in all, that document was like sealed in the beginning, and now at this point, prior to trial... They're trying to get it released to the public. Mm -hmm. And based on how I've interpreted the reporting on the document, it was unsealed at some point after Hughes's indictment. But before there was any reporting on it, the defense put up like this massive fight over just one particular paragraph in the affidavit. 
And Attorney Greenspun specifically said that if that information from that portion of the affidavit was released publicly, it would completely hinder Hughes's ability to receive a fair trial. And I believe he also stated that it could taint the jury pool, which could potentially cause a need for a change of venue. Haran was saying that? No, Greenspun was saying that. He's like, absolutely not. I don't want this one paragraph revealed to the public. He seemed fine with everything else, but it was this one little part. And this was a portion of the affidavit that was sealed up until this point. Correct. Yeah. So the defense did end up getting their request granted, at least for the time being. And the document was resealed until the courts could figure out what to do about it. So you might be curious how one paragraph could potentially hinder his ability to receive a fair trial. And there's this comment that kind of cleared it up. Quote, During the hearing before the 4th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, Greenspun argued that the withheld passage contained an overwhelmingly specific piece of information that is inadmissible at trial and would absolutely prejudice a jury. End quote. Now, I don't know for sure if the Washington Post in particular had access to this one paragraph, but there was mention that they were really pushing to be able to report on the situation. But due to potential legal ramifications, if they did, they kind of held back on releasing the details. And after some back and forth before the trial began, the judge ultimately decided it was okay to keep that one paragraph out of the public eye, at least for the time being. All right, I understand for the time being. Mm Mm-hmm. But how is it inadmissible in trial if it was in the affidavit that essentially got the guy charged? Well, I'll tell you. So we actually know about the details of what the paragraph contained because you and I talked about it last week. This is something that didn't really get released publicly until after trial. So it does come out. But basically, it had to do with Hughes's failed polygraph results. Okay. So due to the fact that the polygraph is completely inadmissible at court because we talked about that last week too with Virginia law stating at the time that sure it could be brought in but the defense had to agree right obviously Greenspun's like "Uh uh-uh that's not happening so I in one respect agree with attorney Greenspun for not wanting the results like more specific results of the polygraph to be revealed because then people might think oh he must have killed her even though this is a trial for abduction with the intent to defile. They probably would have this preconceived notion of him and what based type of questions on were that. asked and his answers. Exactly. Which do you want to know the specifics of that too? Because I have some info on it. Yeah, I'd like to know the specifics of it. But something that I just don't get, and maybe I just can't wrap my head around it for now, is if you know the results of a polygraph or the fact that somebody took a polygraph are not admissible in court unless the defense chooses to allow it to be. Mm-hmm. But yet. The prosecution are referencing this polygraph test in their affidavit. Like, what's the How point? are you using it as evidence to build your case in the affidavit to go forward with charges? Yeah. If it's something that you can't even 100% use in court. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good point. I'm it just not, seems weird to me. I'm not sure. And like I'm going to say a thousand times in this episode, I am definitely not a judicial expert. Yeah. So to like dig into that and also find laws that were relevant 30 plus years ago and get all the specifics on that, you know, you're always lacking on the information because it's, it's so far in the past. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to really nail it all down. But specifically it stated, quote, the paragraph released Wednesday suggested other deception on Hughes's part. When questioned by police the day after Melissa's disappearance, he denied ever seeing or talking to Melissa Brandon at the Christmas party. The affidavit said, end quote. And then it kind of continued with this big question that was within this paragraph, which was, quote, last night, did you kill Melissa? After Hughes answered, no, the polygraph examiner indicated that Caleb D. Hughes's answer to this question showed deception, end quote. So it's specifically saying that he said that he did not kill her and the polygraph is saying that he lied. Yeah. So then how much would that actually taint a jury? If that were released to the Fairfax County and surrounding areas, you know, I agree. And I understand where Greenspun is coming from, Mm. not wanting this to be released prior to trial. Yeah. Once trial starts, I'm all for putting it out there. Yeah. I agree. The jury know, because I don't think you're tainting the jury at that point. It's, it's something that actually happened that pertains to the case. But I don't know if you could actually even talk about the polygraph in general. Yeah. At trial. Unless defense allows it. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know if this would just be completely irrelevant to them and they aren't even allowed to know that there was ever a polygraph even issued mm-hmm. or or given to him, you know? Yeah. 
which sucks because I think that if this is information, if this is, this goes back to my question earlier and mm. what, I, what I was confused about. If you have information that pertain to the facts and circumstances of the case that you put in your affidavit, which essentially gets approved and allows you to charge this person with the mm. crime, how can it be in your affidavit and not allowed to be talked about at trial? Yeah, that's, it's definitely a tough one. If this is a fair chunk of your probable cause for this, mm. or at least one element to the crime, yeah, it should absolutely be allowed to be spoken about and the jury should be made aware of it mm -hmm. during the trial. Yeah. And it's tough, though, because polygraphs are just so, you know, you can go either way on them. So did Greenspun receive his request? Yes. And it was kept quiet until trial started? It was kept quiet until post-trial. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So as I mentioned at the top of the episode, I'm going to give you a rough breakdown of the information that came out after the trial began. And honestly, there is just so much to this case that we would be here for hours and hours on end, and it would be multiple parts if we dug deep into each section of the testimony and all that. So I'm going to give you as brief of an overview as I can, but I'm also going to make sure we touch on all the pertinent points. But before we dive into the trial details, I first want to start by going over Caleb Hughes's early life and his history, because once the trial started, his past was a big thing that came to light, and I think it's somewhat important to know his history. After that, we'll then dive into the trial and all the evidence that was brought against Hughes. So as we know from our discussion last week, Hughes had a criminal record. He'd been in prison from 1985 to 1986 on previous charges for unauthorized use of a vehicle, and he'd been out on probation from 86 to January of 1990 when he violated the conditions of his parole and was sent back to jail to serve the remainder of his five-year sentence. So at this point, he still had about four years to serve. We also learned that he had charges for contributing to the delinquency of a minor, as well as harboring juveniles that had run away from home. But what about his early life before all that happened? Well, it was reported that he'd had a rough childhood and that his parents had a tumultuous relationship. Apparently, they broke up and got back together pretty often, and all in all, his upbringing was described as, quote, chaotic and filled with, quote, constant conflict. His parents did end up officially divorcing in 1976 when Caleb was just 10 years old. And due to the fact that they were now split up, he was kind of bounced all over the place and never really had a steady place to live. And his parents' split also affected his education as well, with him never really staying in one school for a long period of time. And he ended up dropping out of school altogether in the 11th grade. Due to Caleb's upbringing and other issues, he ended up getting himself into hot water with the law when he was relatively young, around age 16. He appeared to be a habitual type offender, at least in my opinion, because back when he was 16, he had been charged with the same unauthorized use of a vehicle charge, and then again when he was around 19, he did the same thing, and that's when he'd gone to jail for over a year. He was also using drugs and alcohol at a young age, and those who knew him or had gone to school with him, worked with him, all that, they all described him as a loner and said he was kind of reserved and introverted. Now, at one point, Caleb had also been put into some sort of juvenile, they called it like a learning center type facility, but I think this may have been after that unauthorized use of a vehicle charge from when he was 16, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Either way, there was this psychologist at this place that gave a description of Hughes and how he was, and they described Caleb as a, quote, anxious person who had difficulty expressing anger and suggested that minor provocations could lead to physical aggression. Testing revealed that Hughes expected relationships to remain temporary, yet he desired warmth and closeness, end quote. So by the time Caleb became a legal adult, he appeared to have a difficult time holding down any sort of steady job. He'd had multiple different odd jobs over the years, including working as a motel clerk, a landscaper, a laborer, a maintenance man, a groundskeeper. And I also realized last week I never mentioned to you how long he had been working at the Woodside apartment complex prior to Melissa's disappearance, and he had only secured the job about three weeks prior to her going missing. And just to touch on something else that we talked about last week and a couple weeks before that, most of his jobs that he's had fit the profile of Rosie Gordon's killer. Yes, agreed. And there was even this article in the Washington Post that kind of described some of his other jobs that he had. So it stated, quote, from March to June 1989, Hughes was a field worker for Professional Grounds Landscaping Company in Fairfax County. After a three-month stint with another landscaping firm, Hughes took a job at the Woodside Apartments in Lorton three weeks before Melissa disappeared, end quote. So he had only worked three months at one place, then he worked another three months at another place, then he only worked 
three weeks at the Woodside apartment complex. So, like, it's very obvious that he can't hold down a steady job. Was he being fired from these other jobs? That I'm not 100% sure of, but I found it to be particularly interesting, and I'm glad that you brought it up, like, the whole situation with those particular type of jobs. Mm -hmm. And landscaping was one that, like, really stood out to us when we were talking about Rosie Gordon's case, especially because she lived in, like, this... HOA essentially like this housing community and you would think that a landscaper would be someone who would be there frequently but would be in and out and would know the area would probably recognize the kids that were there all the time all Mm -hmm. of that and so I just wanted to like do a little bit of digging and a little bit of research on at least this particular company that he worked for the professional grounds landscaping company and that was formed back in 1980 so it did exist prior to both Rosie's case and Melissa's. So it's not like, you know, this brand new company and their, I guess you would call it headquarters, like where probably they kept all of their supplies and stuff, was not very far from where Rosie was abducted from and then later found murdered and then where Melissa had been taken from. It was probably like 20 minutes. So just trying to like go back to that profile because this is the whole reason why I started even looking into Melissa's case was because of what was brought up in Rosie's case and the fact that there could be a connection between the two. Mm -hmm. It was just interesting to me that this is like the exact type of job that we were talking about, that we were looking into. The time frame kind of makes sense. Yes, he was only there until June of 89, but that doesn't mean that, you know. He didn't go back to the area. I mean, if he frequented the area while he was working there, he could be driving through again. Exactly. And at the end of the day, I'm not saying that Caleb Hughes is responsible for Rosie Gordon's murder, but it is something that has absolutely been talked about. And there are certain similarities here, but there are also differences too. So like once I finally dove really deep into this case, like I've already kind of come up with my opinion on Mm -hmm. what I think. And if I think that theory really holds any weight, which we will touch on at the end of this episode, but I think just in general, looking at people in those types of jobs is like the most important thing with really both of these cases. Like, obviously we know like Caleb Hughes is going to trial, like everything he's doing is super sketchy, but that doesn't mean that he didn't like hang around with a crowd that, yeah. you know, kind of acted the same way or were into the same things. Mm-hmm. So or if he had a mentor that he met at one of these jobs that, you know, kind of put the bug in his ear about what he was doing. And mm-hmm. maybe that guy was the one that took part in, Rosie Gordon's murder. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's just like a circle of people that should be or should have been because who knows if they were, but should have been looked into. Yeah. I mean, at this point right now, like you said, there's nothing that proves that Caleb Hughes had anything to do with Rosie Gordon's murder Mm. or even knew Rosie Gordon. Yeah, exactly. It's just when you had the FBI come into her case and create this profile and you're looking for somebody that meets these characteristics. Yep. A lot of Caleb's characteristics overlap with that profile. Yeah. And then if he is found to be involved in an abduction and potential murder of another young girl Mm -hmm. around that same age as Rosie, you're doing a disservice by not looking into him. Exactly. Yeah. There was also something else that was discussed regarding Caleb's past, and that had to do with the tragedy that struck his family several years prior to when Melissa went missing. And I'll read for you what the Washington Post reported on this matter because it's just quite concise. So... Quote, on July 5th, 1987, Hughes's brother Scott and Scott's wife Shannon disappeared after attending an Independence Day party in the New River Valley. Their remains were found in Roanoke County on March 3rd, 1988, and the case remains unsolved. State police sources said Caleb Hughes was a suspect briefly, but was cleared after a polygraph examination and is no longer under investigation. Hughes became a suspect partly because police decided to interview family members, a state police source said. End quote. Now, at first, this totally struck me as odd. So I was like, all right, let me do a little more digging on that. And as recently as 2021, investigators had stated publicly that they actually knew who killed Scott and Shannon Hughes and just unfortunately never had enough physical evidence to charge the person responsible. And that person is now deceased and Caleb Hughes is not that person. But okay, so now let's move on to the trial itself. And I already kind of said it before. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the evidence. And I do just want to preface this whole next portion of the episode by saying I am by no means an expert when it comes to the judicial system. If anything, this is all very foreign to me because we don't talk about trials on this show, really. We're mostly covering unsolved cases. 
So please just bear with me. And if there are any additional details that you want to know about trial, about everything that was reported, you can find all of the source material I use for this episode on our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com. Also, at this point, I do just want to bring it up now that Attorney Haran had mentioned, and it was reported on a fair amount prior to trial, that the case against Caleb Hughes was mostly circumstantial. And I'm pretty sure John and I had talked about this last week. I don't know if we talked about it outside of the episode or within it. I can't quite remember. But we were talking about witness statements and how we felt like those weren't super circumstantial. Yeah, they're not circumstantial. Yeah. If you have a firsthand account of something that actually happened, that's not circumstantial evidence. Yeah. So like there's obviously a lot of witness testimony when it comes to this case. So I just wanted to at least do a Google search and like find out exactly what they classify this evidence as. So according to the United States Courts for the Ninth Circuit website, they define evidence as both direct and circumstantial. And it stated, quote, direct evidence is direct proof of a fact, such as testimony by a witness about what that witness personally saw or heard or did. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence. That is, it is proof of one or more facts from which one can find another fact, end quote. So based on everything we talk about, you can determine if you feel as though this case is circumstantial or not. But I feel like there is a fair mix of both types of evidence, at least in my opinion. So, yeah, I mean, I would say you certainly have direct evidence from all of the witness testimonies from the Christmas party. Yep. But then when you leave the establishment where the Christmas party took place, that's where things start to get a little bit more murky. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay. What do we have for evidence here? Okay, we know that he didn't go home for like three hours. Mm -hmm. That's a fact that we know because he admitted to that. Exactly. We have his wife stating that he wasn't home. That's direct evidence. That's somebody that's stating a fact that they know firsthand. Mm -hmm. But then you're getting into the thing of, okay, we don't know where the body is. We don't know where she is. We don't know if she's still alive. Why did he cut his shoes? Why did he clean his clothes? Yeah. Why did he wash his belt with a knife sheath on it? Yeah. Like these are all circumstantial evidence pieces that don't necessarily prove that he did something Mm -hmm. but it's like okay you have all these people saying that he was there he was weird with her they disappeared probably around the same time he doesn't go right home he's gone for hours after yeah all that's direct evidence yeah and then it's like oh and now we have the circumstantial evidence that he did all this weird shady shit yes once he got home exactly All right, so we're going to start off our discussion regarding the trial with Tammy Brannon's testimony. So Tammy, Melissa's mom, was actually the very first witness to testify at his trial. And there was additional information that was learned about what Tammy had both seen and experienced the night her daughter went missing. So we previously had known that Melissa was last seen speaking with Caleb Hughes after she'd gotten her chips and put her coat on and all that. And Tammy had been one of the people who saw her daughter talking to him. But there was actually more that Tammy had noticed regarding Caleb the night of December 3rd, and there were two comments regarding what she had either seen or experienced with him. The first comment was, quote, Caleb asked me if that was my daughter, if she was my only child, Brandon testified. He commented that she was very pretty. Brandon said it was not unusual for people to say how cute or pretty Melissa was, but I felt there was a reason for Hughes's comments, she said, end quote. The second thing had to do with Hughes offering to take the kids to the bathroom for Tammy. And this was when Melissa was like hanging out with those two other little boys. So I guess Caleb was offering to take all three of them for her. But Tammy testified that she felt as though this was an unusual thing for him to offer, which I 100% agree (laughs) with. And if you're wondering, no, she did not take him up on that very creepy offer. And it's even grosser because Hughes did not even know the Brandons personally. And that was something else that Tammy testified to, that the night of the party was the first time she'd ever met Caleb Hughes. Yeah, what he did was very strange. Yeah, all of his behaviors are strange. (laughs) Right, right. especially now learning that he had this conversation with Tammy. I mean, he's not a parent of one of the children that's offering to bring them all to the bathroom. Nope. That would be a lot different. It's like, oh, my son has to go to the bathroom. He's with... Uh, this other boy and this girl, would you like to all go to the bathroom with me? I'll take them. Exactly. That's completely different. Right. Unlike this guy who, at least we're privileged enough to know at this point, has like prior charges for doing weird stuff with minors. Exactly. Is offering to bring these three young children to the bathroom when he has like no no valid reason to want to do that. Exactly. It's just so bizarre. Yeah. And that's like the only word I could come up with for him is like creepy. Yeah. And I mean, he's calling a young girl pretty. Mm Mm-hmm. 
like he's almost fawning over her. Yeah, I feel like saying like, oh, what a cutie. Like that's different compared to, oh, your daughter's so pretty. Like that just feels really just crossing a yeah, line. It's, over the top. It's, it's just uncomfortable. And you don't know her? No. You don't know the mom. You don't know the daughter. Yeah. And it's like to just come out of the blue and just be like, oh, your daughter's really pretty. Yeah, it's, it's not just like, gross. You know, somebody that Tammy knew and she's like, oh, she's wearing such a pretty dress, blah, 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 or something like that. That's yes. totally different than just some random, you know, 23 year old guy coming over and being like, oh, your daughter's so pretty. Can Who's also the there bathroom? alone. Like what? Right. It's just all and it's all behavioral. Yeah. I feel like, you know, that's just, I guess, subjective for people to think whether or not that's creepy or not. But well, I'll be the one to say that is objectively creepy. It is objectively <laughs> creepy. You know, I just think about the jury and then also the defense, because obviously the defense is going to try and say, oh, this is normal. He had a young son at home and, you know, he would always offer to help people if their kids needed to go to the bathroom or if someone helped to offer him or something, you know, mm -hmm. like I can kind of see how the defense might try and spin that. But I think any normal everyday person is looking at that saying, no, that's that's freaking weird. I do not like that. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think that you and I are not your average person either. I think that we have a more cautious outlook on people. Agreed. Yeah. So it's more along the lines of, OK, what angle are you playing at here coming up and telling me my daughter's pretty? Yeah. Not. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, she is, isn't she? Mm -hmm. Like, it's mm -hmm. like, well, why are you saying that to me? I don't know who you are. And why are you looking at my daughter like that and trying to take her to the bathroom? Yeah, That's it's weird. just weird. We're just much more cautious yeah. and maybe judgmental in that respect mm -hmm. than I'm sure the defense would want us to be. This is very true. And you know what? I ain't mad about it. I'm going to continue to be cautious. <laughs> right. So, yeah. But all right, let's now move on to what we learn about what other witnesses saw that night in the clubhouse. There were several witnesses for the prosecution that testified to seeing Caleb with Melissa at different points that night. And we talked last week about how Hughes had apparently made strange sexual and inappropriate advances towards older women at the party. So one witness testified that she had seen Melissa sitting on Hughes's lap at one point that night. And someone else, and it might have even possibly been Tammy as well, that testified to this. But they said that Hughes had even given Melissa a cupcake the night that she disappeared. And multiple other people had mentioned how they just saw him hanging around the younger kids, obviously including Melissa. And overall, his behavior around the kids was weird. It was creepy. It was uncomfortable. Right. If you got a kid at home, why aren't you home with your kid and your pregnant wife? Exactly. Tending to them as opposed to, you know, having random people's children on your lap, feeding them cupcakes that who knows if it's laced with something, Ugh. offering to bring them to the bathroom, telling them they're pretty, like just a lot of red flags here. Absolutely. And don't forget that Hughes had later lied to investigators about being around or knowing or even talking to Melissa the night she disappeared. Yet now you've got this plethora of witnesses saying mm -hmm. they all saw him with her. That's a huge red flag. Right. Now, in regards to the women Hughes had supposedly made sexual advances towards, there was this one guy, actually, a guy named Alan who had testified regarding this. And he said that Hughes was talking to him about several women at the party and said that he'd like to, quote, take them to bed, which, again, I don't know how many times we can reiterate it. Like this guy is married and has a pregnant wife at home. <laughs> this is gross. And, and I feel like he doesn't even know any of these people. And he's just going up having weird conversations with all of them. Exactly. And I think that goes back to like what that psychologist had said about him and like all these other things about his past he doesn't seem to be able to like have normal relationships with these people like he's expecting them to go one way but they're going another way mm -hmm. and i just feel like a lot of his history kind of goes into this behavior it's it's bizarre mm -hmm. i agree and there had actually been reporting on this at some point later but hughes had apparently bragged about being unfaithful to his wife and made comments like, quote, what she doesn't know won't hurt her. And mind you, this Allen guy that testified about all these remarks, he, too, had never met Hughes prior to the party. That's what I was imagining. Yeah. Like, this guy's just going up to random people, and he's like, oh, a lot of hot bitches up in here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the guy's probably like, who the fuck is this guy? Well, exactly. well, I'm here with my wife and children at a Christmas party. Right? Like, this is like, a very oh, innocent I cheat event. on my wife all the time. What she doesn't know won't hurt her. Know what I mean? Gives him an elbow nudge. And yeah. the guy's like, okay, creep, I'm leaving. Exactly. <laughs> like, it's all so very strange. And you just keep adding it on top of everything else. And the thing about it, too, is like this guy also said, like John was just kind of explaining, all of these comments from Hughes were completely out of left field. He didn't 
say like, oh, that lady looks nice in her dress or something. And then Hughes was like, oh, I'd like to take her to bed. You know, it's like they're probably just chatting about random mundane things. And then all of a sudden he's like, check out that hot girl. I'd like to take her to bed. (laughs) Like that is just so unprovoked. It's weird. I think of him like this random guy, the witness. Yeah. He's like looking at somebody off in the distance. Like he's glancing at another woman. Yeah. And then Hughes just comes up and he's like, Nice piece of ass right there, isn't it? Exactly. Like, something like that, just totally uncalled for. And the guy was probably just looking around, not checking anybody out. Yeah. But Hughes saw that connection. He's like, oh, he's looking at another girl. I'm going to go say something. So like that's that. like where his mindset is. Right. His mindset his is. Exactly. Yes. Now, there was also another witness that had testified for the defense. And of course, the defense wanted to try and do whatever they could to make it appear as though someone else took Melissa, not their client. I mean, that's got to be the defense at this point, you know? He's on trial for abduction with the intent to defile. Mm -hmm. Try and do whatever you can to make it seem as though Melissa is somewhere else and not having been with Hughes or not where they think, you know, he put her or something. Right. I think it's an uphill battle because you have all these people pretty much blowing Hughes's lie up in his face that he had never seen her or talked to her Mm -hmm. when all these people are saying that he's interacting with her and commenting about her. Yes. It's a bit of a stretch to imagine that somebody would believe that This guy did not have something to do with her abduction Mm -hmm. after the most base layer lie of, oh, I never knew her, I never saw her, was stated by him, and then it's proven to be false. Exactly. But these are things that I didn't want to totally gloss over when it comes to the trial either, because at the end of the day, there are two sides to a trial. It's not just the prosecution. Right, but we're talking about the defense right here, right? And we're talking about how they're going to build their case. Exactly. And how are they going to get him off. Yes, how can not you easily, win? Not right. easily at all. That, but that's what we're saying, right? How can you? Obviously, there are two sides to this. Mm-hmm. But if your side is saying, no, I never saw her, I never met her, I never talked to her, and we have multiple witnesses stating otherwise, yep. your case is gone there. Exactly. So, so like, what are you going to do, do you to go try from there? It, yep. Right. So anyway, this defense witness claimed that they had seen Melissa at a Chuck E. Cheese location sometime after she disappeared. So this is some random defense witness That they were like, oh, did anybody see Melissa Brandon anywhere ever? And somebody came forward and they're like, oh, I saw her at a Chuck E. Cheese. Fantastic. You're getting subpoenaed. You're going to be my star (laughs) witness to say that Melissa Brandon was at a Chuck E. Cheese sometime after she got abducted. It's either that or I think it was just like witness sightings that came into police as well that had to be turned over to the defense. And they probably combed through those to try and find Mm -hmm. the best ones that they could then subpoena to say, no, 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 this is a good lead. This is a good tip. Why didn't they look into this? This other lead, you know? Right. So this witness testified that they had seen a man at the Chuck E. Cheese and said he was accompanied by a girl who looked like Melissa. And authorities were called. The sighting was reported to police. But regarding that sighting, Detective Wilden, we had talked about him last week. He was like one of the first detectives that arrived on scene. He, quote, testified that police carefully checked out numerous reports of such sightings. But he said police could not follow up on all the dreamers, the nightmares, the premonitions, end quote. (laughs) So I think you can absolutely infer how he felt about these sightings. Right, and that goes with what you had just said, how during discovery, defense probably got all of these sightings, Mm -hmm. and then they combed through to try and find the best ones, and these were the non-psychics, the non-mediums, and the most believable people of the bunch. Yeah. But, I mean, you have these detectives that are saying that they went through and they tried to follow up on them Mm -hmm. and none of them were good. Exactly. So, yes. Now, continuing on with witnesses, let's now discuss Carol Hughes's testimony. Remember, that is Caleb's wife. And I got to tell you, there is one big bombshell within her testimony that I think is going to just make you question things even more than you already are. And that has to do with where Hughes was and what he was doing the night of December 3rd after he left the party. So first and foremost, she did say that she did not believe that her husband had anything to do with Melissa's abduction. She testified to a bunch of the stuff that we talked about last week, including how she'd gotten several calls the night of December 3rd by either authorities or residents of the Woodside Apartments when they were looking for her husband. Like we talked about last week as well, she told everyone that called her house her husband was not home, but she later believed and testified to the fact that she felt like Caleb had gotten home around 1130 that night, but she said she hadn't physically seen him until about 1220 when he walked into their bedroom. She said that her husband got home 90 minutes earlier than what police testified to at trial, and 
I think the police probably testified more along the lines of like when they got the call from Caleb versus the time that Carol was saying around 1130. Remember, he had called police. I think it was like 1, 130 in the morning. Right. But Carol also received calls between that 1130 and 1, 130. Correct. From police asking if he was home. Mm -hmm. And she stated no. So now she's going back on what she had previously stated. And she's like, oh, no, he was here earlier than that. But she, I believe he was, but I just don't know that he was. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of, it's wishy-washy. Like, did you believe it? Are you just saying this is what you thought versus what you know? Well, she has to be stating on what she thinks because yeah. based on her previous statements, she did not believe that her husband was home at that time. Yeah. And if she was stating that back then, mm -hmm. there was no new memory that could pop up into her head to be like, oh, wait. Oh, he was here. I remember him walking into the bedroom and I just so happened to look at the clock and it was 1121. Yeah. And then when I got a phone call from the police a little while after that, I had totally forgotten that he was home. And I said, <laughs> no, he's not home. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah, you can't say ahead of time that, no, he was not home at that time. And then later on, he say, was oh, home. no, he was home. Yeah. You don't know that for a fact. You're just probably going based off of what he wants you to say exactly. or whatever he told you was true. Yeah, yeah. And to think about, too, like the whole thing with her saying, oh, the load of laundry was in the dryer at that point, and it would have taken about 40 minutes for the load to run through. So you're looking at, like, she's doing math here. You know, it's like, oh, well, 40 minutes back from 1220 must have been around 1140. Maybe he got home a little earlier than that mm -hmm. to put his load in the in the washing machine. You know, that's like how I see her process and right. her head going of why she's coming up with that time, mm -hmm. not definitive I heard him come in the door at this time. Right. She's providing circumstantial evidence. Correct. Not direct evidence. Yes. Agreed. I'm glad <laughs> that you brought that up. Now, Carol also mentioned in her testimony that prior to her realizing that Caleb had gotten home, she had called a bar twice that night that he often frequented called the Hillbilly Heaven in Lorton, Virginia. What a name. I know, honestly. And she also tried calling her husband's father sometime after midnight to see if he'd seen his son. Carol was also asked the big question that John was, you know, just asking about. Well, I guess not just asking about. You did ask it last episode and you were insinuating it just now. But why did she not get out of bed and right. look around the house for... You have all these people calling and waking you up asking about your husband. Yeah. Why not get out of bed and look? I don't know. I don't get that because you bet I'd be up. I'd be checking my house. And you to got to think, out. too, we're also talking back in the 80s. Yeah. Unless you had a phone right by your bed, you're getting up out of bed anyway to get to the corded phone that's probably True. in the kitchen. I didn't think about that. That's a good point. Right. They're not wealthy, so it's probably a phone centrally located in the apartment. It's not going to be in a bedroom. It's going to be like in a living room or it's going to be in a kitchen. Mm hmm. So you're not answering from your bed to begin with, most likely. It's possible. It is possible that she could have just to play devil's advocate. Not that I'm saying she did, but most likely want... not. Yeah. Also, specifically, the Washington Post reported that attorney Haran, quote, asked her why she did not first check the house or her parking space for her husband before she started calling around to find him. Carol Hughes, who was about four months pregnant and already in bed at the time, said she hadn't seen her husband and assumed he wasn't there, end quote. Right. So there's no way that you can now go back and say, oh, yes, he was certainly there an hour and a half prior to him calling police. Exactly. So I just think it's it's weird, though, because I don't know if that was just like her response to that question. Like, well, why didn't you get up? Well, I just assumed he wasn't there. Like, that's not really an answer. Right. Not like, why did you not? Because you were pregnant? Because you were tired? Because your feet hurt? Because you were annoyed? I mean, there could be a multitude of reasons, but I don't even know if she ever answered and gave a reason. Well, I mean, you would assume that receiving these calls over and over again would annoy her as well. That's what to the I would point think. where she would get out of bed and look for him and say, answer the freaking phone because all these people are calling for you. Exactly. Exactly. It's wild. It's absolutely wild. Now, the thing that I find to be the most odd about this whole situation, though, is the fact that Carol Hughes was apparently already suspicious of her husband and believed that he may have been seeing someone else, which, based on everything we know so far, she was probably right in thinking. Right, because that other witness just said that Caleb had had admitted to him or had bragged to him mm -hmm. about his infidelity. Exactly. And saying what his wife doesn't know doesn't hurt. It's it's just wild to me. So just to circle it back, I find it odd that she's now thinking, okay, my husband might be having an affair. I'm getting all these calls with people asking where he is, but I'm not going to get up out of bed and look for him. 
Well, I assume that she probably already had some type of idea that there was an affair going on. Yeah. So she probably knew that he wasn't home because maybe he came home late. Yeah. Relatively frequently. But you know what she was doing? Mm. She was tracking the mileage on his car. Interesting. You won't get out of bed to go double check your house, (laughs) but you will check that mileage. Right. So the whole mileage thing is the bombshell that I was telling you about a few minutes ago. So I can't quite tell if she was questioned about this at trial. I'm pretty sure she was, but I do know that authorities testified on this whole thing at the trial. So basically, Carol had been keeping an eye on the mileage on their shared vehicle. I believe it was a shared vehicle. And she clocked whatever the mileage was prior to Caleb taking the car to the party at the Woodside Apartments on the night of December 3rd. And by the time he got back and by the time she looked at the car again, there had been 51 additional miles put on that car. Outside of what it should have been or just in total? I think in total. So the most that it should have been, if Caleb was being truthful about what he'd done, going to the party, coming home from the party. It was like 16, right? 16 to 20. Yeah. I said, okay, if it's eight miles to the party, eight miles back, that's 16. But he also had, you know, talked about this whole beer trip, how he went and got a six pack. So I was like, you know what? We'll give him two miles each way for that. Right. You know, just add an extra four there. Regardless, with that math, there are an additional 26 miles completely unaccounted for. Mm -hmm. That to me, coupled with everything else we know so far, is pretty freaking suspicious. Yeah, it's very suspicious, especially because Caleb doesn't have an alibi. Mm Mm-hmm. And... Since we're on the topic of the mileage, I do at least want to bring this up because there is a Forensic Files episode on this case that brought up the situation with the additional mileage. But in their coverage, they stated that there were only an additional 12 miles on the car. Now, I don't know if that's based on the amount of mileage that they believed should have been on the car. And that's kind of what they calculated or if it was a mistake. But regardless, in that episode, it was mentioned that authorities did create this search radius of those 12 miles to find really anywhere that Hughes could have gone based on that. And then they conducted additional searches in that area to see if they might be able to come up with anything, but unfortunately just came up empty. Well, that's what I was saying in last week's episode, when you have a time period Mm -hmm. of when we last saw Caleb Mm -hmm. and when he at least contacts police, if you have a three hour window or a three and a half hour window, you need to account for traveling to a location and back from a location. So you have what? an hour and a half's worth of driving distance yep. or radius from his last known location mm-hmm. to start building your search area from. Exactly. And I learned the whole thing with the uh, the string and how you do yeah. that, like where you pinpoint it and then mm-hmm. you do, you know, a calculation or whatever, and then you make your little circle around the area. I was like, yep. oh, that's so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do just also want to bring up something else that has to do with, I guess, two different statements, one that Carol made and then another that came from defense attorney Greenspun. And again, this goes back to the defense's side of things, not just all the incriminating evidence from the prosecution side. So Carol had said that the police, quote unquote, tricked her husband into going to the station with them when he had been questioned and later given the polygraph. And it was brought up that he apparently believed he was supposed to be going out to help investigators search for Melissa. And that's why he was, quote unquote, tricked, which I just think is so stupid. But that was like something that she testified to felt as though he was tricked into going with them and then tricked into being questioned and tricked into giving the polygraph, you know? Well, if you're claiming that you were tricked into going to the police station and then you end up in an interrogation room, Mm -hmm. you don't get tricked into talking. Just keep your mouth shut if you think you're in a bad spot at that point. Exactly. They didn't force him to say anything or force him to take the polygraph. Yep, exactly. I completely agree. And then Greenspun had said that authorities didn't properly Mirandize his client, yet Later court documents that came out several years later after the initial trial for a different matter stated that police did not Mirandize him because he was not being arrested. Essentially, to paraphrase the document, Hughes was told by the officer who gave him the polygraph that he was not required to take the exam, that he was not under arrest, and that he could even leave whenever he wanted. So due to that, he was not Mirandized. And I think Greenspun had been like trying to get something out of that whole situation, whether it was, you know some issue with the charges or the indictment and not even going to trial or getting a mistrial or something. But at the end of the day, the judge was like, no, he knew that he did not have to go with them. He did not have to answer their questions Mm -hmm. and he chose to do so. So that is on him. The police don't have to Mirandize you once you're arrested for a crime. They only have to Mirandize you if they're going to ask you incriminating questions 
regarding the crime that you're being charged with. Yes. All right. So I think that's about it when it comes to witness testimony. So now I do just want to move on and do a brief overview of the blood evidence, which we talked about this last week. But due to the fact that the luminol had essentially destroyed the genetic characteristics of the blood found on the steering wheel, floor and pedals, there wasn't too, too much to go on with this piece of things. But that was not the only blood evidence. Basically, to keep it short and sweet, there were two expert witnesses that testified about the blood evidence, both from the FBI, one testified for the defense and one for the prosecution, and they both had differing opinions on blood that was found on a tissue in Caleb Hughes's car. The defense expert was a guy named Dwight Adams, who was an expert in DNA identification, and the prosecutor's expert was a man named Robert Grispino, who, from what I can tell, worked more in the field of blood typing but the two were essentially under the same departmental umbrella of the FBI. This whole piece to the testimony went exactly as you would expect it to. The defense's witness said the blood on the tissue did not belong to Melissa and was definitely Hughes's blood, whereas the prosecution's witness said that it was possible the blood could have belonged to Melissa, but didn't belong to Hughes. <laughs> the whole situation was tough, though, because based on reporting done for the Associated Press published in the Richmond Times-Dispatch, quote, Grispino's analysis was based on normal blood typing, Adams' work was the result of the more specific genetic testing, end quote. Now, this whole piece of the testimony on blood evidence got a bit wishy-washy because there had apparently been a DNA test performed, likely by Adams, the defense's witness. But attorney Horan did not call him as a witness. Maybe when he got the results and they didn't quite fit the prosecution's narrative, he didn't want to use that witness's testimony. But it got even weirder after trial. And I located this document that said that the prosecutor's witness ended up changing his opinion to be more in line with the defense's witness. And it was like this whole thing about the prosecution's witness supposedly potentially being pressured into making this change because it looked bad for that particular department within the FBI. You know, there are like these differing opinions between two people who work in the same department. Mm -hmm. But it was found that there was no coercion or anything, and the opinion was changed because that's how the expert felt after further review of the evidence. So I don't know if it was like right after trial, if it was at the end of trial. I couldn't quite tell like the date of the document that I found, but either way, it almost seemed like the blood evidence ended up being more beneficial for the defense than it did for the prosecution. Well, that's unfortunate because, of course, this blood was found on a tissue. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's winter. Your skin gets dry. Yeah. Yeah. Friggin' Hughes could have just blown his nose and had a bloody nose at the time mm -hmm. versus all of this blood that was underneath the pedals mm -hmm. in the driver's compartment of the car that unfortunately got destroyed with the luminol. That there probably has a better chance to not be linked to Hughes, mm -hmm. but sounds like we'll never get anything with that because, like you said, most of it was destroyed. Exactly, yeah. And the last piece of the blood evidence that I wanted to touch on had to do with Hughes's shoes, which goes back to what we talked about last week, obviously, with the blood on the floor and the pedals, all of that. And we know that he had either like shaved or cut pieces of the soles of his shoes and the shoes were put through both the washer and the dryer. So by the time authorities got their hands on them and were able to test them, much of the evidence, if there was any to begin with, was gone. However, it was mentioned that there were stains on his shoes kind of near where those cut marks were. And it was said that those stains contained human protein, which experts testified was consistent with human blood. It's totally unclear whose it was, when or how it got there. And honestly, it's just another one of those things that it just seems like it's almost like a moot point because you just can't tell whose it was. And quite honestly, like if he had a bloody tissue in his car from potentially having like a bloody nose or something, he could have mm -hmm. stepped on it. It could have gotten there at any point. What I think is more damning, though, about that is the the behavior with the shoe right. rather than what was unable to be really tested on the shoe, you know? Yeah, I guess my only question would be, could that human protein that could resemble or be linked to blood, could it also be linked to sweat? Could it also be linked to any other human protein? Or is it specifically those stains containing that human protein ensures that that stain is blood? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. That's a good point, though. And I think like back in 91, when this trial was going on, you know, they probably didn't have the type of technology to give mm -hmm. you that answer. Today right. could totally be different, though. Yeah, like you said, it's kind of a moot point. It's like, oh, yeah, well, there were stains here and it could be blood, but it very well may not be blood. And even if it is blood, it could be his blood. And it's like, OK, what does it mean for anybody? What you does know? it mean? Right. The, the behavior of him going home, washing all of his stuff, shaving down his shoes, Last being seen with Melissa, mm -hmm. all that stuff is way more pertinent to the case and trying to build a case and get him convicted exactly. than all of this other information that 
probably goes over the layman's head in mm-hmm. the jury, and they're like, oh, okay, I don't know what I'm supposed to get from that, but let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. Like, I totally know what you mean. All right, so the final bit of evidence we're going to discuss that was used at trial is the hair and fiber evidence, which I personally think was the strongest evidence brought forward by the prosecution, at least considering the fact that this was 1991 and technology was not nearly as advanced as it is today. Yes, I do think that this type of evidence is very subjective now, but back then it appeared as though there was a lot more stock put into hair and fiber evidence. So the process of gathering the hairs and fibers and identifying them was painstaking, especially due to the fact that when authorities searched Hughes's car, it was said to be super dirty and cluttered. And on top of that, I guess they also had two large dogs with hair found all over everything in the car. And there was trash and just random stuff everywhere. Overall, authorities focused heavily on the front passenger seat of the car in their collection of this evidence and had used masking tape instead of a special vacuum cleaner that they used to use at the time to collect what was on the surface of the seats in the car, and again, more specifically, the front passenger seat. There are several bits of evidence within this hair-slash-fiber evidence category, if you will, so we'll start with the rabbit hair evidence that we touched on at the end of last week's episode, which allegedly came from Tammy Brannon's coat she was wearing the night Melissa was abducted, and then some of those hairs from her coat were found in Hughes's vehicle. The night Melissa went missing, Tammy Brandon was wearing a very specific rabbit fur coat that had previously been purchased in Germany and was dyed a rare black bluish color. An FBI special agent, Douglas Dietrich, who was an expert in the FBI's hair and fiber unit, is who worked on this evidence. And there were actually quite lengthy sections in both the FBI files and forensic files episodes where he was interviewed and he described like this whole process he went through when he was working on the evidence. So for everyone listening, I suggest giving those two episodes a watch so you can get a good grasp on like what he did with all of this testing. And you can find both of those episodes right on YouTube. But regardless, when it came to the rabbit fur, he was able to take the hairs found in the car and match them to the hairs on Tammy's jacket. And he said he determined there was a, quote, corn cob texturing to those hairs and confirmed they were a match based on that coupled with the specific coloring. And it was also determined that Melissa had likely gotten some of those hairs on her the night of December 3rd. And then those hairs transferred from her clothing onto the front passenger seat of Hughes's vehicle. And John, I did send you a picture of the coat that Tammy was wearing that night. And then obviously for everyone listening, you can reference that photo on our website and on our socials. So it's the blue one you're talking about? Yeah, it's like bluish black. Mm -hmm. Kind of furry. Yeah. That's the rabbit fur? That's the rabbit fur. It's definitely an interesting color based on like where the fur is laying. Like if you rub up on it or rub down on it, it looks like it could kind of change color. What is it? White and gold versus... uh, The dress. The dress. Yeah. What is it? It was white and gold versus... White and gold and blue and black, I think. (laughs) I always saw it as white and gold. I've honestly looked at it two different times and seen two different colors. So I don't know what that's all about. Who knows? I find it interesting that they were keying in on the front passenger seat of the car. Mm. If you're saying that this guy's vehicle is like trashed and it's just full of junk and whatever, and he's abducting this young girl, don't you think the trunk would be a good place to be putting her if you're trying to abduct her? I mean, it's a good point. But also, if you think about it, if he's trying to get out of there quickly, at least thinking about cars back then, like, could you pop a trunk? Or do you have to like put the key in and whatever? Like if you're just getting in the side door and you're like putting her on the seat next Mm -hmm. to you and just driving off rather than taking your key out and opening up the trunk and putting her on the trunk and then taking the key out again and getting Mm -hmm. to your door and putting yourself in the car. Yeah, I I don't know. know. I think uh, if he locked his doors, he'd have to unlock his doors with the key. He'd have to unlock the trunk with the key. He'd probably have to open the trunk with the key. I don't know. I don't know about the make and model of his vehicle, but... I mean, I assume they looked in the trunk. I just don't think they found anything, and I Mm -hmm. think that's when they started to key in on the the front passenger seat because that's where they ended up finding all of this stuff anyway. So I'm just wondering if her belongings were there after the fact. Mm, that's that's something like to think was, about, yeah. if he was taking her clothing to burn it or something. That's a good point. Because I'm not sure. in his past and with this case showed, you know, pedophilic tendencies. Mm. And if he sexually assaulted her and then took all of her belongings and was going to get rid of them after he had put her body wherever. Mm-hmm. I, don't know. I just thought it was weird that they keyed right in on that from passenger seat because I'm thinking you abduct somebody, right? You got to stop them from jumping out of the car if they have the opportunity to do that. You got to stop them from fighting against you while you're driving. Why would you want to put them in the passenger seat if they don't want to be there, right? Yeah, Like yeah. If they're going to try and escape, mm-hmm. why would you want them in the passenger seat when you can put them in the trunk and they can't really fight? Yeah, it's true. But you also have to think about her age too. 
younger children, I feel like, are less likely to defy adults because they're mm-hmm. taught to listen to older people. I guess. So, I mean, you never really know. All I know is that what, what they found was on that seat. Yeah. So, okay. could have gotten there at any point. But the other hair evidence that authorities gathered from his car was head hair that was believed to belong to Melissa. Now, based on my research and what I've been able to find regarding this evidence, I honestly have no idea if it belonged to Melissa or not. I really can't tell. Some sources state that the hair was a match to Melissa's based on a comparison to hair taken from her hairbrush. Other sources state that it wasn't a match at all. And then there are some that state it could have been a match, but it was inconclusive. So, you know, as someone- But again, these aren't DNA tests. No, this is exactly. Hair, hair tests. Yes, this isn't like oh, you have the root and you can compare it to a DNA sample. This is just like comparing what the hairs look like. Right. So it's super. Hopefully, subjective. at least under a microscope. But I, I would assume so. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you know I'm kind of skeptical when it comes to the hair evidence. I think we might have talked about that in Kim Simon's episode. Okay. I know we've talked about it a couple times. Yeah. Because and I'm DNA always... wasn't there yet, so a lot of investigators were hanging their hat on like hair evidence. Mm. And blood evidence, not blood DNA, but blood type evidence. Yes, I remember those two kind of went hand in hand. Those were like the beginnings of the transformation into DNA testing. Yes. It was like, oh, blood type and hair. Yes. And then hair without the root. But now we Mm -hmm. know if you have hair with the root, you You can can do DNA DNA testing on that. So Mm -hmm. either way, I think, again, this is one of those things. It's a moot point in the case. Obviously, they're going to bring it up, but it doesn't seem like it helps either side, if you ask me. Yep. You never know, though, with a jury. I know. That's the tough part. It could be part. one person clings on to this one thing mm-hmm. that you maybe thought inconsequential to mention, yeah. but that one person really focuses in on that and, you know, it either gets you a hung jury or it gets you what you want or whatever. So it's worth stating because you never know what a jury's going to think, yep. but in the grand schemes, it may not really mean a whole lot. Yeah, I totally agree. But all right, the big evidence and what I personally thought was the most detrimental and appeared to hold the most weight has to do with fiber evidence that came directly from the outfit Melissa was wearing the night she vanished. The fibers located on the front passenger seat of Hughes's maroon Honda Civic were said to be 50, 50 blue acrylic fibers and 10 red cotton fibers. Now, I gave you a description of what Melissa had been wearing when she disappeared in the previous episode, but I'll go ahead and refresh your memory now. And then, John, I do have a picture that I sent to you of the exact outfit Melissa was wearing. And again, all our listeners, you know where to find pictures, website and socials. So Melissa was last seen wearing a pink nylon hooded jacket, a navy blue acrylic sweater with a yellow applique of Big Bird on the front, a red and blue plaid cotton skirt, red tights and black patent leather shoes with gold bows on them. Just the sweater and skirt, though, are the pieces of evidence that we're really going to focus on at this point. The sweater and skirt were from this particular Christmas collection of Sesame Street outfits that were sold strictly in a JCPenney catalog. And I believe it was the Christmas prior to when Melissa went missing, so that would have been back in 1988. The fibers used specifically to manufacture the Big Bird sweater were said to be incredibly rare and, quote, only used in a limited amount of clothing, end quote. Melissa's grandmother had purchased the sweater and skirt for her through the JCPenney catalog the year before, and there were only about 7,000 of this particular outfit manufactured. The trouble, though, was the fact that Melissa's body and none of her clothing had been located, so investigators did not have the exact outfit that she was wearing that night to then compare these fibers that they found on the seat to. At that point is when Doug Dietrich was working to try and find that exact outfit. So JCPenney was contacted and authorities attempted to locate one of the outfits and were unfortunately out of luck due to the fact that the clothing pieces were over a year old and had all been completely sold out, all 7,000 of them. So kind of now back at square one, investigators worked through a list of people who had bought that exact outfit the year before to attempt to get one of those garments in their possession to then compare the fibers to. And thankfully, they were in luck, and according to the FBI Files episode on this case, a man had bought the exact outfit for his granddaughter the year before, and it was luckily an unworn version of the outfit as he got it for her in the wrong size, so she never ended up wearing it. And so this guy ended up mailing the outfit to the FBI, and they began their testing of the fibers. Now, again, also according to the same FBI Files episode, when it came to testing the navy blue fibers, Agent Dietrich wanted to be sure he could confirm without a doubt that they definitely belonged to this particular outfit and nothing else. 
So he had multiple people that he worked with provide him with navy blue acrylic clothing items to test. And he ended up being given like 100 items to test. All in all, they got 126 different fibers, did over 7,000 comparison tests, and not one of those fibers matched any of the ones found in Hughes's car except for the Big Bird Sweater's blue acrylic fibers. Those blue fibers were all the same length and the same diameter, which led investigators to believe they all came from the same sweater. And they even had manufacturer experts testify at trial, and they stated that there was a very specific dye color that was used to produce this item, and it was called Plum Navy Number 887. And JCPenney wanted to make sure that no one else had access to this dye, And they even went as far as patenting it as a signature dye. And from how I understand it, it was only used to manufacture those particular Big Bird sweaters. So when you're talking about how this is the most damning evidence to Hughes's case, Mm -hmm. it's pretty much without a shred of a doubt, the fibers that were found in his car could only have come from the outfit that Melissa was wearing. Exactly. Yeah. It's this very unique color that no one else has access to. It's been patented strictly for JCPenney. They only sold 7,000 of them. Yeah. And you're comparing it to a multitude of other acrylic fibers, and none of them are coming out the same size, the same length, the same color. I mean, the dye itself itself is enough to be like, okay, it was only used on this one thing mm -hmm. outside of the fact that all these fibers don't match other fibers in length and diameter and everything like that. The fact that you found these fibers with that dye. Yeah. And the only thing that could be from is the outfit that she was wearing. Yeah. Seems to be that there is at least evidence to believe that Hughes came in contact with Melissa Mm -hmm. and got those fibers on him at a bare minimum. Yep. And got those into the car. But why would there be 50? Right. But more likely, Melissa was in his vehicle. Yeah, exactly. That's what it seems like. And I do remember Dietrich saying something along the lines of being worried about the evidence in the beginning before he actually had all the details from JCPenney and all that Mm -hmm. because the color wasn't like a blue blue. Obviously, it's plum navy. So it's like purple blue. So Mm -hmm. he's like, oh, is this actually going to be right? Because she's in this blue outfit. That's how everyone's been describing it to me. Mm -hmm. But then once he got the item, he's like, oh, okay, hold on a second. This isn't exactly the color I was thinking it would be. Yeah. So the fact that they like went through all these levels to get all of these details, like that's why I think these fibers are like the biggest deal in this case. Now, there were also those red cotton fibers found, which were said to be a match to Melissa's skirt that she was wearing. We know it was a plaid skirt. And that evidence was compared. It was said to be an exact match. And I think it was also Agent Dietrich working on all of these things. But to play devil's advocate as the defense would, Greenspun had said that even though they found those red and blue fibers, what wasn't found were yellow or green ones, which were said to also be in the plaid design on Melissa's skirt. Mm -hmm. Which you would wonder, well, why wouldn't there be, you know, other colors? But to play devil's advocate right back, according to the FBI files episode yet again, there were also yellow cross fibers from the skirt that were found on the seat of Hughes's car as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I think even without the red fibers being found that are a match, an exact match. Yeah. To her skirt. Mm -hmm. You still have the plum navy fibers from this very specific outfit Mm -hmm. that couldn't be on anything else. Exactly. All these other things that they did find that are also a match to her outfit are just icing on the cake. Yeah. Your your whole base is like these plum and navy fibers couldn't have come from anywhere else. Why are they in the car? Exactly. That's the main question. And since we're on the subject of playing devil's advocate, there is one other thing that stood out to me that I thought was not particularly strong for the prosecution and could maybe make a jury question if Melissa had ever been in the car. And that had to do with fingerprint evidence. Apparently, after dusting for prints, the only ones found in the car belonged to Hughes and his family. None of Melissa's prints were located there. Which, I mean, at first glance, I thought like, okay, that's kind of weird. Wouldn't you think if she was placed in the front passenger seat that she would have touched things? Mm -hmm. But there could be other reasons why. I mean, I know... It seems like chloroform would be more of a problem than it is today, yeah. <laughs> but that's that's also possible. You know, well, she could have been go... knocked out and not been able to touch something. Yeah, that would go more in line with your idea of, you know, maybe she was in the front seat mm-hmm. or not your idea, but the idea that she could have been in the front seat. If she was incapacitated, then she wouldn't be fighting him and he wouldn't have to worry about that. Yeah. Versus if you have a young girl actively resisting you, trying to fight and trying to escape from you. Yeah. 
But if she's incapacitated, you put her on the passenger seat. That's why they find all the fibers there. Mm -hmm. She's not going to be fighting against you. She wouldn't be touching things, so you wouldn't have the fingerprint evidence. Yeah, and I also wonder, too, because I don't think I ever heard anything about this, but, like, could she have been wearing gloves gloves Mm -hmm. because it was so cold? Maybe. And, like, she grabbed all her stuff. Like, I know when I was a kid, you know, it was always, like, you had your gloves tucked in the pocket of your winter jacket, so you might have just had them, and, like, maybe after she had her chips, she put her gloves on, and then that's when she was taken. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, it's something that is something to question no wonder the defense would want to bring that up like if she was in the car why wouldn't any of her prints have been in there yeah but there are also other reasons that you can think of to say well this this or this could have happened for prince to not be in the car Mm -hmm. so i think again it's like one of those things that's like how's the jury gonna take it yeah i mean i think that the absence of evidence is not evidence agreed yeah i i get that versus okay we have this evidence that she was there Mm -hmm. just because there's not something else there doesn't mean that she wasn't there yeah exactly so but i could understand how the defense is saying that trying to confuse the jury into thinking oh yeah that's true that's not the only thing she was wearing why wouldn't all these other fibers be there yeah you know makes perfect sense. you're just trying to confuse the jury into thinking oh yeah forget about that plum and navy Mm -hmm. very specific one what about all these other ones that aren't there that's true Okay, so at this point, I want to move on and talk about something that we, again, touched on at the end of last week's episode, and that has to do with the motive for the intent to defile addition to the abduction charge. As we know, the state had the burden of proving that to the jury, and the fiber evidence is actually one of the biggest sticking points for what Attorney Horan stated would be the biggest reason for him having pursued that intent to defile piece to the charge. So I've said it twice in the last two episodes, but we haven't really honed in or like focused on it. But Melissa was last seen wearing a pink nylon coat. So John, I had sent the picture over to you. And I think when you look at that photo, you can tell that the coat's actually kind of long, especially considering that Melissa was only five. You know, she's obviously quite short and it looks like that coat would probably go down to her knees. It's a long coat, Mm -hmm. which you would assume would cover her entire outfit, especially if she's all zipped up, ready to go, because her mom told her, come on, put your coat on, we're going to go home. Yeah, it would at least cover her skirt. Exactly. So attorney Horan argued that this is why he went after Hughes for intent to defile, that those fibers that were found on the seat of Hughes's car would have never gotten there if Hughes had not removed her coat. And what other reason would he have had to take her coat off? Mm -hmm. The intent to defile. That makes sense. There was also the argument that those sexual advances Hughes had made that night towards the older women at the party were indicative of his intent to defile Melissa as well. And it kind of went back to his mindset, like what you were saying before, like his deviant thoughts or Mm -hmm. things like that. So that was just like another layer added on. Mm -hmm. And just to go along with the intent to defile portion of that, if he abducted her and she is nowhere to be found now... I feel like that goes into the intended to file too, because, Mm -hmm. okay, if you just abducted her and brought her somewhere, where is she now? I totally agree. So the trial itself lasted for about eight days. And after all of the testimony, the jury went out to deliberate on March 7th, 1991. And after only about nine hours of deliberation over two days time, the jury chose to convict Caleb Hughes for the abduction and intent to defile of Melissa Brannon. They recommended a 50-year prison sentence based on the charges against him. And when a jury member was later interviewed about the sentence and the deliberations that got the jury to their ultimate conclusion, the Washington Post reported, quote, One juror, Bobby Zirk of Springfield, said the panel's first vote on whether Hughes had abducted Melissa was unanimous. The jury later voted, again unanimously, that he had taken the girl with the intention of molesting her. Zirk, 49, a machinist at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, said the jurors based their decision about Hughes's motive on the fact that Melissa has not been found. If he hadn't planned to defile her, he would have brought her back, Zirk said. He said jurors also considered testimony that Hughes was rejected by two women at the party, end quote. Overall, the jury ended up saying that the fiber and hair evidence are what held the most weight for them when it came to their decision to convict him. Now, regarding the choice for a 50-year sentence, some of the jury members said they figured that after 50 years in prison, Hughes's sexual desire would be essentially non-existent by the time he got out, and he would have been roughly in his late 70s at that point. I don't know about that one. I know. We talked about There's a this. a lot of horny old men out there. I know. It's so true. Yeah. I, it made me think of um, Mark Warfel in Tracy Crow's case. Mm-hmm. 
Where, which is in the news now. Which is in the news now. We're going to have to put out an update on that. But he had dementia and all of that. And he was making these like inappropriate sexual advances towards people. Women and neighbors, and, right? Didn't he crawl into his neighbor's window? There was something that he got arrested for before where he was like assaulting a woman. Mm -hmm. Something happened with that. But then when he was in custody, he was acting very inappropriately towards people as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. So, you know, I just think about that and it's like, okay, even if he's in his 70s and he's getting out, like it's very possible he could still be a, a wicked creep. Yeah, absolutely. So. Look at Hugh Hefner. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> But back in 1991, a judge had to somewhat abide by the sentence that the jury suggested, and they were not able to raise that sentence, but the judge could lower it if they saw fit. However, at Hughes's sentencing hearing on April 12th, 1991, the judge in this case did end up sentencing him to the full 50 years in prison. And you can't forget he already had the additional four years from the unauthorized use of a vehicle sentence from back in 85 that he had violated parole on. So grand total amount of time for Hughes to serve would be 54 years. The annoying thing, though, was he would be eligible for parole in just 12 years time. Which blows my mind. I, I go on rants every time that we talk about like, oh, good behavior gets these people out of prison early. It's like you're in prison. How are you really going to behave that bad unless you're a freaking idiot? Mm -hmm. Like you should be behaving because you want to get out of there and you don't want to have any more time tacked on but you committed a crime and you were sentenced for that crime, you should do the time that you were sentenced for. I completely you agree. You shouldn't have the opportunity to get out early. Nope. Especially in cases that involve children. Yes. Totally agree with that. Now, I'm sure to no one's surprise, the Brannons were glad that Hughes was convicted, but overall were heartbroken that they still did not know where Melissa was. Tammy Brannon stated at one point, quote, this isn't really a victory because I still don't have my daughter back but maybe it will save another child pain and another mother anguish. Our family is going to do everything in our power to see he never gets paroled, end quote. The Fairfax County PD did state publicly that they would never stop looking for Melissa, and they did also say, prosecution included, that if Melissa's body was ever found, that they would likely seek murder charges against Caleb Hughes. But even as of today, Melissa's case is still considered an open and unsolved homicide as they have never located her remains. There was also reporting later that Tammy had actually even gone to the prison and attempted to speak with Hughes about where her daughter was. NDTV reported, quote, In 1991, after he was convicted, Brandon told The Post that she had spoken with him once, briefly, without revealing the circumstances. He did not deny taking my daughter, but he did not confirm it, she said. I told him I knew he had taken my daughter. All I wanted to know was where she was. At one point, I thought he was going to tell me, but he didn't, end quote. Well, if you think about it, this guy's supposed to do 54 years, but he may only have to do 12. If he gives her any information that ends up producing her daughter's body, mm -hmm. he's now being charged with murder and will probably go away for life without the possibility of parole. Exactly. So he'd be an idiot to give any information about it mm -hmm. as far as where her, her body's located. Yeah, absolutely. And... There's no statute of limitations on murder. So, right. you know, even to this day, who knows if he would ever agree. I feel like it would be like a deathbed confession, if anything. Yeah, I mean, if anything, but it's probably something he'd take to the grave with him because it seems like a piece of shit, so. Yep, agreed. And I just wanted to bring up something else, too, about Tammy that she said at one point. So she stated, quote, the man was guilty. I know a lot more than the press knows and what the jury knew. And I knew the man was guilty from day one. End quote. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wonder like what she meant by that, especially like what she potentially knew more than the press did, because, you know, I was thinking back to the polygraph, like obviously if they couldn't bring that in at trial, the jury wouldn't have known about that. But, you know, what more did she actually know that was never released publicly? Because, you know, authorities will divulge more, especially if there's a good relationship with a family they'll give them more information than they would the press. Well, I think of her being like Jerry and like doing uh, exactly. her own digging. Yep. And I wonder if she talked to Carol mm. and Carol maybe spilled the beans about a bunch of shady stuff that he had been doing. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to fast forward a little bit to June of 1991, two months after Hughes had been sentenced. At this time, information came out regarding the fact that the defense discovered two additional witnesses that they believed could have helped get Caleb acquitted. Greenspun argued that his client deserved a new trial because he hadn't known about the witnesses when the trial took place back in February. 
Greenspun said that one of the witnesses, who by this point in time was a sheriff's deputy in another county, but in December of 89, he had lived in the Woodside apartment complex. And apparently he could testify that Caleb was not at the party for approximately 30 minutes prior to when Melissa vanished. So at first you might think, wow, that's kind of a big deal. But of course, this article in the Roanoke Times stated, quote, a police detective has testified that during a telephone interview, Kiefer told him he didn't see Hughes during the time in question and could say only that he never saw Hughes leave the party, end quote. Right. You can't say that he was there. He wasn't there. It's just you didn't see him. Exactly. And anybody could say that that was right. There, there were over 100 people there. Exactly. So a detective with the Fairfax County PD later testified that this witness also did not provide specific times of when he saw or did not see Hughes at the party. And just to add to it, an Associated Press piece in the Roanoke Times stated, quote, Kiefer said defense attorney Peter Greenspun may have misunderstood what he told him in an interview, end quote. <laughs> Even better. It, right. So the whole thing is just like less and less credible as we find out more. Right. Greenspun's just trying to spin something. Of course he is. To try and get his client, you know, out of jail or get him a new trial. Or to get a better record for himself, you right, know? Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the second witness that came to Greenspun's attention after Caleb's conviction was another person who claimed to have seen Melissa after she disappeared. So that would have been an additional sighting on top of the one we talked about at the Chuck E. Cheese. Mm -hmm. And obviously we know that the defense wanted to bring forward any witness that could say that Melissa was somewhere else, right? Right. Now, this sighting came from a man who was said to be a lawyer and had allegedly seen Melissa the day after she'd been abducted, and he had said he saw her on a subway train in downtown Washington, Virginia. This witness stated that he'd seen Melissa being hidden under a coat on the train and had called authorities about the sighting on December 5th, the day after he'd allegedly seen her. Here's what the witness stated about what he'd seen on the train that day. Quote, She was under the control of a white man and woman. As I approached them, they tucked the coat in around the figure that was laying across their laps inside the coat. The woman would tuck the coat in, look up, and look back down at the coat. Her behavior was very unusual. As the couple got up to exit the train, I saw the face of a child beneath the coat, which had fallen open. I am certain that this was Melissa Brannon, end quote. How good of a view could he have had of this girl's face? Honestly, I, I really don't know. Like, if she's covered by a coat... And they're clearly, based on his own statement, attempting to cover her and keep mm -hmm. her covered. First of all, that's incredibly concerning for whatever child is under that coat mm -hmm. because it seems like something nefarious is going on there or right. was going on there. But how can you say it with certainty that it was Melissa Brandon? Exactly. You can't confirm what she was wearing to match up to what she was last seen in. Like, none of those things are jiving. Think of, like, the shadows that are cast by being underneath a coat and poor lighting in a subway. and Exactly. I don't know. I, I would take that one with a grain of salt. Agreed, yeah. So you might also be asking why wasn't this witness known about or disclosed to the defense? Well, apparently, the witness felt like police didn't necessarily believe his story, and he didn't want to get more involved because of that. But Greenspun claimed that he never received the information that this sighting existed in the documentation provided to him from the prosecution. And at one point, Attorney Haran said the tip had, quote, no value because the man who allegedly saw Melissa couldn't provide a good description of her to investigators. And what's really wild about this sighting and the whole situation surrounding it is that one of the investigators that took this witness's statement had even admitted to trying to lead the witness <laughs> to get more or get better info from him. Oh, she had brown hair, right? Oh, and she was this tall, right? Exactly. And he said, quote, I even tried leading him, but the more I pushed him, he said, I told you, I just got a glimpse of her, right. end quote. Right, so that's not a sighting with certainty. Yeah, that's not someone saying 100%, I know for an absolute fact it was her. This is what she looked like. This is what she was wearing. This is how she was acting. This is who was with her and what right. they looked like. Right. That's not a certain sighting, if you ask me. No, I saw two shady people, a guy and a girl, on mm -hmm. the subway, acting shady, trying to conceal what he believed to be a juvenile underneath the coat. Yeah, exactly. It's ridiculous. And for all you know, maybe it wasn't something nefarious. Maybe it was a game the kid liked to play. It's possible, but that's also weird. So. <laughs> it's weird, but like if the kid is on the subway in public and yeah. doesn't want to be hidden under a jacket. I guess this is true. I mean, either way, regardless, I just don't think it's a good sighting. And that's, I think, what it all boils down to. Yep. And of course, the prosecution did not agree that either of these witnesses would have changed the outcome of the trial. And the judge ultimately denied the request for a new trial. And 
Interestingly, that first witness, the sheriff's deputy, the one that was like, oh, yeah, he misunderstood me. He even stated publicly after the fact that he felt like his testimony wouldn't have helped either side of things. Again, a moot point in so many moot points (laughs) within this trial, right? Right. Then come June 22nd, 1993, so this is about two years later now, there was a wild development in this case. So after Hughes's conviction, Greenspun had stated that he'd planned to appeal it, and it appears as though he did. And even though it took some time, at this point, it's now almost two and a half years later after his original conviction, but it got reversed. Hughes was to remain in prison until the prosecution decided whether or not they would retry him, But spoiler alert, attorney Horan did say that he would have planned to do so, but he needed to confirm overall, like, why are the courts overturning this? I don't understand. Mm -hmm. I need to get down to the brass tacks of this and say, like, what's the reasoning? Should I recharge him with just abduction or can I go at him again for the abduction with the intent to defile if this reversal stays in place? Mm -hmm. And again, you can't forget he's already in prison for those additional four years from the other charge. So it's not like he's getting out of prison immediately because this is being reversed, right? Yep. So I believe it was three of the Virginia Court of Appeals judges that felt as though the trial proved Caleb had abducted Melissa, but they said it did not show that he did it with the intent to molest her. They said there was insufficient evidence to prove his intent for that. The Washington Post expressed what the judges stated was their reasoning for the overturning of the conviction, so I'll read that for you now. Please do, because I don't understand what they could see right? to make them think that way. Quote, Judge Bernard G. Barrow wrote, The only way a jury could believe that Hughes intended to sexually molest Melissa was by resorting to surmise and speculation. The judge said that to infer that suggestive remarks made by Hughes at the party about adult women meant that he intended to molest Melissa was mere speculation. And Hughes's attention to her at the Christmas party, saying she was pretty, allowing her to sit on his lap, offering to take her and two small boys to the bathroom, is consistent with an innocent interest in children, he wrote. Moreover, the judge said, the prosecutor relied on expert testimony that large numbers of blue fibers found on the passenger seat of Hughes's car meant that Melissa was not wearing her coat. The prosecutor contended that this was evidence that Hughes removed the coat to sexually molest her, the judge wrote. The evidence, however, does not reveal who removed the child's coat or why or when, Barrow wrote. The appeals court also ruled that the prosecutor withheld some statements from witnesses and from Hughes that could have helped his defense. In addition, the defense was only given one-fifth of the more than 900 sheets with tips to police about Melissa's whereabouts, the court ruled. End quote. So I have a lot of problems with that judge's statement. I completely agree. I think the one that kind of took me aback the most was stating that Hughes's actions displayed a mild interest or something like that in kids. An innocent interest an in innocent children. Inter- oh my, that's like, that's not no. an innocent interest in children. No. Let me bring you to the bathroom. Oh, come sit on my lap. Oh, I'm going to call you pretty. Here's this cupcake. Right. Oh, you look so nice. I love your dress. Like, bro. And he has a pass away. for harboring juveniles, buying them alcohol, letting them stay with him when they run away from home. What Cheating do you think on his is going wife, on all there? these other things. He's not a good dude. No, like that is not an innocent interest in children not at all a predatory interest in children 100 percent. i totally totally agree the whole thing about the withholding of information that goes back to like what we talked about way way in the beginning about how the defense was having a hard time getting documentation from the prosecutor's office Mm -hmm. there was like a lot of back and forth in regards to that but it doesn't look like there was any sort of violation i wasn't able to find any information on that i don't know what the laws were at the time if it was just Well, I'm wondering, like, what did the prosecution receive for the number of pages of tips? Yeah, how are there 900 pages of tips that the defense only got a fifth of? Well, you never know. I mean, police may have gathered 900 pages of tips, but when they built their case to go forward for charges, Mm -hmm. that may not have been included in their case folder. And maybe, you know, (laughs) what they're leaving out or what they're omitting Mm -hmm. is the fact that the prosecution only used a fifth of the pages as well for their case. Yeah, that's true. So I don't know. There's a lot I just don't know about the legal system. So it's like, you know, to try and wrap your head around it, to even grasp like what's going on with this trial, because this is, this is like the most intense research I have ever done on like any case I feel like so far. And there's just a lot of like 
legal things that can go either way. And it's just tough to nail it all down. I think what I rest my hat on is that prosecutor Haran does not seem like the type of person that would purposefully violate his duty to provide information to the defense, risking a mistrial on this case when he essentially knows or believes that this guy is guilty of the crime. Yes. Like he's not going to do that Mm -hmm. just to try and win one over on the defense. No, absolutely not. He wants to keep this dude in prison. He wants to do things by the book. And that's what a lot of people said about him too. Like he, even though he was secretive, you know, he'd keep his thoughts and opinions to himself until he got in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. He still was like very methodical in doing things the way he should have been doing them to make sure his conviction stuck. Yeah. So, I mean. So I don't think that he was doing anything malicious to not provide the defense with what was required. Yeah. And of course, like going back to that whole thing about the blood evidence too, like no shit, he's not going to bring in a witness that's going to not agree with him. Right. Like that's every trial in the history of forever. You know, they're not going to be like, you know what, for the prosecution, I'm going to bring in a witness that's going to tell me, nope, the DNA doesn't match. Like that's not what you want. Right. Exactly. So it's just how it's the way of the world. It's how it works. But regardless of our opinions on the matter, the state attorney's office asked the Virginia Court of Appeals to re-review their decision, and they wanted it re-looked at by the full 10-judge court rather than just the, I think it was the three, who originally voted to overturn the conviction. So the first hearing was set to take place in December of 1993, and by June of 1994, the panel voted with a 5-4 vote to uphold the conviction. And one of the three judges who had originally chosen to reverse the conviction had stated, quote, I was wrong. The circumstances surrounding the child's disappearance, the fact that she has not been found, and the conduct of the appellant both before and after the child's disappearance support the conclusion that he abducted the child with the intent to defile her, end quote. And then Chief Judge Norman Moon wrote, quote, A five-year-old female child is abducted by a male stranger. No effort is made at ransom and theft. Robbery, parental abduction, or personal animosity are excluded as motives. The only natural and reasonable explanation that flows from the evidence is that the abduction was for sexual reasons. Furthermore, Hughes' intense interest in sexual matters that evening at the Christmas party shows his state of mind, end quote. Very eloquently put. I agree. Yes. I always feel stupid when I talk on the podcast because my my thoughts don't flow well out of my mouth. They flow way smoother on paper i know I, and i'm opposite i feel like i've yeah. struggled to get it on paper versus talking about it no when i write something down and i can put it in text it's like a 10 out of 10 yeah versus when i'm talking i sound like an imbecile i don't think that's true and i don't think any of our listeners would agree with that either but <laughs> we're always harder on ourselves than yeah, other yeah, people yeah. are but yeah and i will say too the the judges that still you know didn't agree to uphold the conviction because it's a 5-4 vote here they claimed that there just wasn't enough evidence to prove that his intent was to sexually molest her. But I completely 150 percent disagree with everything that those judges believe. So. How can those four judges look at that chief justice's mm-hmm. statement and not be like, oh, yeah, huh? yeah, you're right, bro. Yep, exactly. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy to me. Yeah, but it is what it is. The world is crazy and filled with idiots. This is quite and true. some of those idiots become judges. Honestly, and I am very pleased that at least one of them switched it over and, you know, tilted it to the other side so that this conviction could be upheld. Now, at this point, we'll fast forward another year, this time to June of 95. And there was a headline in local papers that stated that authorities had received a lead the month prior from a guy that worked for a Virginia power company. And he was working at Possum Point Power Station and stated that he had located a piece of red cloth in a pond there. So because of the fact that Melissa had been last wearing a skirt with a fair amount of red fabric in it the night she disappeared, authorities decided that this was a good enough lead to search the pond. They brought dogs to the site and surprisingly, the dogs alerted. And that, coupled with the fact that sonar showed that there was something in the pond, made authorities super hopeful that they would find something in the water. But shockingly, nothing was located. That's weird. Right? I was very surprised by that. And I was only able to find like an article or two about it. Hmm, Interesting. What was it? An anomaly of what? A rock? Well, I mean, based on sonar, it could show a rock. It'll show any type of mass underneath the water i guess Uh, but like a body-sized mass yeah that's wild and with dogs alerting too though like that's yeah that's wild what did the guy originally find a red piece of cloth red piece of cloth Mm -hmm. Mm. 
Because you have to think at this point, it's now six years past the time that she disappeared because this is now 95. Yeah. So even if the cloth was just red and it didn't look plaid or something, you could assume if it sat in water for that long, it would probably degrade a little bit. The color would be different. Maybe so bleed. regardless, yeah. I think it was a good thing that they searched it, even if it didn't match up perfectly. You know, it's it's still red cloth. It coincides yeah, if they had the little. resources available and the time available to do so, it's yeah. worth looking into. Mm-hmm. Now, the next month, there was also a claim that FBI agent Douglas Dietrich had withheld evidence in the trial for Caleb Hughes. Remember, he was the guy that had done like all the hair and fiber testing. And very bizarrely, it was apparently O.J. Simpson's attorney, Johnny Cochran, that Mm -hmm. was claiming this. And I only found this very brief article about it, but attorney Haran responded and stated, quote, he prepared a very detailed report and we provided this entire report to the defense. Johnny Cochran does not know what he is talking about when he said Dietrich surprised the defense by failing to provide the report, end quote. Now, after this, there was quite a lull in searches and attempts to find Melissa, at least based on what I was able to find that was publicized. And don't get me wrong, this case has been talked about a ton. Countless YouTubers, podcasters, media outlets have all covered this case and discussed it in detail. But after Hughes was convicted, that conviction was upheld and he was serving his sentence, there really weren't many new developments. And then, unfortunately, 2019 came around and Caleb Hughes was released from prison. NDTV did report that authorities tried to get Hughes kept in prison indefinitely, and an article that they had published stated, quote, As Hughes's release date approached, Fairfax prosecutors asked Virginia state officials to consider an indefinite civil commitment which is used to keep sex offenders who are likely to reoffend in confined treatment after their criminal sentences are served. But after a review by Virginia's Corrections and Behavioral Health Departments and the Attorney General's office, no petition for commitment was filed. Brannon said that she was told that Hughes did not meet the criteria for such commitment, end quote. Now, you might be asking, how is it possible that he was able to get out in 2019? That math is just not adding up. If he was sentenced to 54 years in 91, how could he be out in 2019? That's only 28 years later. Obviously, we had talked about parole, but it's not parole that he got out on. He got out on something that John was real pissed off about earlier, and that is good behavior. I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So he ended up released at 53, which completely contradicted everything that the jury felt like with him getting out earlier, you know, losing that Mm -hmm. sexual desire, all of that. So he was released on August 2nd of 2019. After his release, he was required to register as a sex offender. And the last I heard, he was living in a halfway house in Lynchburg, Virginia. Now, the Washington Post did explain the whole situation regarding parole and good behavior allowances. And let me tell you, this is so beyond convoluted. So I know I feel like I've been reading a lot of quotes for you at the end, but these people are very concise with the way they're explaining things. And due to me just not being any sort of expert in this, I think it's just better I read it for you so you get a a better grasp. So according to this piece, quote, In September 2017, Hughes was considered for parole and rejected by the Virginia Parole Board. The reasons listed were the serious nature of his crimes. Release at this time would diminish seriousness of crime and the board considers you to be a risk to the community. It is not known if any of Brandon's family testified against him. Hughes was considered again for parole in August 2018, but declined to meet with a parole interviewer, a board official said. The board then rejected him again, stating Hughes had no interest in parole. By then, Hughes may have known his term was ending, Under Virginia law, before the abolition of parole, there are four classes of good conduct allowances. For particularly exemplary prisoners, 30 days of credit is given for every 30 days served, meaning a prisoner could cut their sentence in half. A second class allows 20 days credit for every 30 days served. A third class allows 10 days credit for every 30 days served. And a fourth class allows no credit. Prisoners can move from class to class over the years changing the amount of good conduct time they are credited with. Prison officials said they could not discuss the records of particular inmates, end quote. And I just gotta say, the fact that the parole board was saying two years before he got out of prison that he is a danger to society, yet because he was under this Virginia law of 
good conduct. Good conduct back when he ended up in prison. Now it's okay. Right. That doesn't add up to me. No, I think that if you have the opportunity for parole, Mm -hmm. that should take precedent over anything else because a board is reviewing you, the crime you committed, and where you are today. Mm Mm-hmm. I could understand good time on like a misdemeanor charge. Yeah. Think about how many people are still in jail on drug charges Mm -hmm. stemming from the 90s and early 2000s. Exactly. That may not have this benefit of being able to, you know, work up all this good conduct time. Mm -hmm. Yet this guy who abducted a young girl is a sex offender who has a record of other prior charges Mm -hmm. is just denied by the parole board two years earlier gets to just say, oh, I don't care about parole. I got my good time and I'm getting out. Exactly. And you can tell they said it too. Like he knew he was going to be able to get out. He's like, that's why I didn't go in 2018. Board. Yeah, right. exactly. So it's just, it's, it's ridiculous if you ask me. I agree. And we could gripe on it for the rest I don't of forever. Think, but. Yeah, I think that there are some crimes that if you're convicted of, you do not have the opportunity for good conduct, for good conduct time. Agreed. I understand like if you get sentenced to you know, life without possibility of parole, Mm -hmm. that's one thing. But you also can't get out on good time, right? Mm -hmm. So why can these other people who have also committed heinous crimes, just because they're not sentenced without the possibility of parole, Mm -hmm. they can get out early? Like you're committing a serious violent felony. Mm -hmm. You should never be able to use good time to get out early. You should Mm -hmm. have to serve the crime that you were convicted of. Or if you have good conduct allowances, you should have to go in front of the parole board and have them deem whether your good conduct allowances yes. will allow you to then be released from prison based on their findings of everything as a whole. I mean, let's think about this. Going back to Randall Breer from Rosie Gordon's case, mm-hmm. he's still in jail today. Right. He is still in jail today. Don't get me wrong. He had way more charges than Caleb Hughes did, mm-hmm. but he has been denied parole every single time, regardless. And of I bet if- he's not building up that. That good time. Exactly. Good behavior or whatever. No. So if he, if the parole board is saying, no, you can't get out because you're a danger to society, and they said the same thing about Caleb Hughes when he went up for parole in 2017, that should be the end of that. That should be the trump card that says, no, you can't get out early. Just because you're a good little boy in prison with a bunch of other men doesn't mean that you're going to be good when you get out when you have a history or you have a conviction for right. abduction with the intent to defile of a five-year-old girl. Right. That's very different circumstances. I agree. BS. Bullshit. Okay, so at the time that we're recording this episode, it is April of 2023, and it will have been nearly four years since Hughes was released from prison, and there is still no sense of closure for Melissa's family. Her body has still not been located, and investigators are still working hard to chase down leads and figure out exactly what happened to her on that night in December of 89. Tammy Brannon had stated, quote, The Fairfax police never cease to amaze me with their dedication to this case, what they're doing and what they've done all along. They've never stopped, end quote. And recently, authorities have put out a plea to the public for anyone who knew Hughes back then to come forward with information that they may have about this case. One of the detectives also mentioned in the past several years that investigators were working with the FBI and the Virginia State Crime Lab to see if there was additional testing that could be done that wasn't available back in 1990 and 1991 when this case originally went to trial. And they also made mention regarding the store that Hughes said he picked up beer at on the night of December 3rd, and that's something that they would like more information about as well, and more specifically about the location. It was said to be a Highs convenience store, and I guess they no longer operate in Virginia, and I honestly don't know for sure, but I don't think authorities know exactly where the store was located back in 1989. So I'm assuming that they're asking for that information from the public so they can locate a more like pinpointed spot to where Hughes might have been that night. If he actually did go get the six pack of beer, where was he and where could he have gone in that radius that we were talking about earlier of the mm-hmm. additional mileage on the car? Yeah. And I think that's just a perfect example of one of those little tidbits of information that in a case, you know, could just seem like it's not going to help anything, but it could be nailing down exactly where he was that night and then finding a better area to search that could ultimately lead to finding her remains all these years later. Yeah. And potentially charging him with murder. Exactly. I think we've talked about it numerous times how the easiest way to live a lie is to have a little bit of truth in it. So if he really did mm-hmm. go to this highest convenience store to pick up the beer, you know, like you said, that could be that small piece of evidence 
that nails down a better area to search Mm -hmm. or a better radius to search around and then might turn up the one piece of evidence that they need to blow the case wide open again. Yep, agreed. And included with that, people who may have known Caleb Hughes, people who might have frequented that bar with him, remember the hillbilly heaven, people who were friendly with him, maybe others who worked with him, who had gone to school with him, who were in prison with him, shared a cell with him. Any of these people are people that investigators want to talk to today. They want to know if you know anything. And these are the types of tips and leads that could help to find some sort of resolution in Melissa's case. Now, before we finish up this episode, I do want to circle back to what we talked about several weeks ago in Rosie Gordon's case. We talked about it earlier in this episode and last week's episode, how we were going to get back to this theory that even prompted me to get into my research on Melissa's case. And that theory was that Caleb Hughes could have potentially been involved in both cases. And there were several headlines in a couple news outlets that said that authorities were looking into a potential connection. And of course, you have your Web Sleuths users, your Reddit commenters over the years that have expressed their belief that there is the potential that there could have been a connection here. I personally have not been able to locate any confirmation by authorities one way or another if they ever defined that there was or was not a connection. And you would have to think that after 34 years, you would have heard something. But there's also the possibility because this man is out that maybe it's something that police are keeping close to the chest. You never know. Personally, for me, I will obviously let John give his opinion. But for me, I have a hard time with this strictly because of, well, I guess a couple things. So first, I don't know where the heck Caleb Hughes was on July 2nd, 1989. That would be big. If authorities knew where he was, if he was at work, if he had an alibi. If he was working for that landscaping company that you would refer to earlier. Exactly. What about his car? He drove a maroon Honda Civic. He did not drive a blue metallic car. I don't know if he was ever even a mechanic or someone who would have had access to another type of car like that. So if I had those two questions answered, I think maybe I could, you know, hang my hat a little bit more one way or another. But it's just one of those things where, of course, people have brought it up. Of course, authorities have thought about it. It's something that you can't not vet because it would just feel like they're kind of glossing over this big thing that's kind of staring them right in the face because of proximity, because of their age, because of just all the similarities, especially when it came to the profile. Mm -hmm. But... I don't know. I just don't think I can hang my hat on it without knowing more information. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't expect you to either. Yeah, there's definitely not enough out there to say one way or another. Right. It's hard to even say that you lean towards the idea that Caleb Hughes is responsible for Rosie Gordon's murder Mm -hmm. because there's just no evidence there to prove that he was in the location at the time, to prove Mm -hmm. that he knew who Rosie was or anything of that nature. Really, the only things that make it seem possible are... The characteristics of Hughes that match the profile, Mm -hmm. his seemingly predatory interest in children, Mm -hmm. and his conviction in Melissa Brandon's case. Exactly. All of those things make him, you know, a candidate for being a suspect if evidence were ever to be brought forward that placed him in the area at that time. Mm -hmm. But in lieu of any of that evidence, placing him there around that time or... Anything of that nature. Or him just, saying something to someone about it. You right. Know? You just can't say that he was involved in it. It's, no. Yeah, there are similarities there. He fits the profile. And based on his record, he could be good for it. But mm-hmm. there are any number of people in the U.S., maybe even in the Virginia area, yeah. that could fit that same profile. Absolutely. So who knows? And that was just something that I wanted to bring up, too, is the fact that if he was like this, if Randall Breer was like this, How if many there other were, were like this, exactly. And did they all frequent the same type of areas? Did they hang out at bars? Did they talk? Like, obviously, we know that Caleb had a special spot he liked to go to at that mm-hmm. bar. Did, you know, he divulge something to someone? Did other people divulge other things to people in bars? Like, yeah, I mean, I don't think that there was a Facebook group like Pedophiles Anonymous. But, no, of you know. course not. But I feel like people talk and then they start to realize, oh, you're kind of like I am. And then they test the waters with what they can tell other people. I would almost argue against that, though. I think that they wouldn't be friends. Maybe that dang Criminal Minds episode has completely tainted my entire view (laughs) on that. Do you know the one I'm talking about? No, I don't. Yeah, it's where there's these two guys who like move in next door and they both have a propensity for 
attacking young women mm-hmm. and they become like best friends and they do it together. And well, I think that, you know, I could be totally wrong on this. But if you think about like somebody that is willing to abduct and molest children and murder people and murder children, and then they find out that there's somebody nearby that's just like them, mm-hmm. they may be like, oh, no, they're sloppy. They don't know what they're doing. Oh, I'm not like you. Like, you're a dirtbag. I do my thing for this reason. Like, I don't necessarily think that they would drive and be friends and be like, oh, here's my tips on how to do this. Here's my tips on how to do that. Oh, I did this. I go this place. I go that place. Well, there's a Criminal Minds episode for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> there's a Criminal Minds episode for every There literally is. There's like 323 episodes. So. Yeah. But yeah. To be I exact. Mean, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> I don't know that for sure. But yeah, I just think, you know, just to go back to Rosie's case and, of course, Melissa's case, I feel like we have more of a an answer even though there's not really an answer in melissa's case but well i mean we know who is guilty of at least one piece of it i mean without melissa's body we can still infer yeah that she is deceased yeah and most likely at the hands of the person who abducted her agreed yeah and there's no evidence to prove that right now but you can make an educated guess yeah and that goes in court yeah and that goes back to the whole thing with the whole no body Back in, you know, 1991, whereas if they were able to pinpoint exactly where it happened, even though they still didn't have her body, they could have pursued those charges. And I think that's where this case just got so wishy-washy. I feel like if they could have, if it were today, Mm -hmm. they would have gone after those charges. Same scenario, but today. Yeah. Go after the murder charge. Exactly. But I think for Rosie's case, it's one of those things where looking at that profile, I feel like is going to be really big in finding the person who killed her and I guess but I I still remember back to when we first started talking about Rosie Gordon's case the person that I was imagining would not necessarily have fit the profile that the FBI put forward yeah I don't know it's tough there is there's so much back and forth with it and it's it's hard when you have these cases where there just isn't a lot of information that's publicized and of course with Melissa's case it was completely different there was so much information to weed through whereas you look at Rosie's and you're you're grasping at straws to get as much information as you can to try and put something together so there's the possibility that there are very very pertinent details that we just don't know because it's not like you have a trial to look at all the stuff exactly that's the thing in Rosie's case nobody was ever charged Mm -hmm. so none of that information was ever put out in discovery and put out to the defense and prosecutors and was never publicized so the reason we have so much information from Melissa's case is because it did go through that process. Yeah. So you may be surprised at how much information is out there for Rosie's case, just not available to the public because it hasn't reached the point of charging and, you know, a trial. Yeah. It just sucks at the end of the day. And as much as you would hope that you could find a connection and you could say like, oh, yeah, I think that this person is also responsible for that. Well, I mean, there are a lot of people that could listen to this podcast and be like, I think know, it was him. Caleb, he's definitely dead. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? But then you have a conversation and you say, okay, but what evidence is there to prove that he did it? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, he was just a bad guy and he did it to this person. So I think he did it. And it's just, unfortunately, it's not the way it works. Melissa Brannon was just five years old and had her entire life ahead of her. She deserved to grow up and go to school and make friends and live a happy, normal life. But that was taken from her. Tammy Brannon has never been able to bring herself to legally declare her daughter deceased because she has held on to hope for all these years that she could still be alive. She missed out on so many experiences with her daughter, her growing up and having kids of her own, and Tammy being able to become a grandmother. Not knowing whatever happened to Melissa has been heart-wrenching for their family, and they deserve to know where she is and give her a proper burial. As Tammy said back when Caleb Hughes was arrested and convicted, quote, This isn't really a victory because I still don't have my daughter back. We still don't know where Melissa is. Until I know what happened to my child, it isn't over for me. If you have any information regarding what happened to Melissa Brannon the night of December 3rd, 1989, or know where her remains are located, please contact the Fairfax County Sheriff's Department at 703-246-7800 or the Federal Bureau of Investigation at 202-324-3000. 
Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at Wicked Deeds Pod and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode.